Uh, so, welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. My name is Liz Jesse, and I'm an outreach specialist at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. On behalf of the Biotech Center, UW Extension and Cooperative Extension, uh, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, I would like to welcome you uh, to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Um, so tonight, it's actually my pleasure to pass on the introduction mic to Ellie Feitlinger. I did that right, yeah. Um, Education and Outreach uh, Coordinator at the Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center. So, welcome Ellie. Hello, and welcome to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm very excited to be here. Again, my name is uh, Ellie Feitlinger. I work for Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center and the Outreach and Events Coordinator. I'm super excited to be here to learn a little bit about Ice Cube, the biggest and strangest detector in the world. And I'm really excited, okay, because we get to hear from Justin Vanderbrook and actually a little bit about Justin. Um, he is an assistant professor at UW Wisconsin, at UW Madison's Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center. He's actually based primarily in the physics department with a joint appointment at the astronomy department. A little bit about him, though, is really cool. He received his PhD, actually, at UC Berkeley and eventually moved here to Madison in 2013. In addition to his work at uh, Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, Justin leads construction of a camera for detecting the highest energy photons in the universe and is also the leader of the Distributed uh, Electronic Cosmic Ray Observatory, DECO, a uh, citizen science project which enables users to detect cosmic rays with their phones. So let's join and welcome Justin Vanderbrook as he talks about Ice Cube and all of our discoveries. Okay, good evening. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm also really excited to be here. I've been waiting most of my career to be able to announce some, some news like this. It's a really exciting time for, for our field. So I'm going to try a little bit of an experiment tonight. In, in science and in physics and astronomy, we don't often tell stories in chronological order, but I'm going to attempt to do that here. You can tell me how well that experiment works or doesn't work. So I'm going to borrow some techniques from other storytelling disciplines like theater. So we need to start our storytelling by introdu introducing who the main characters of the story are, and then setting the stage and the when and where it happened in addition to who. So starting with who, we have four main characters of the story, starting with this giant galaxy across the universe. That's part of the title. This is called a blazar. It's a giant black hole. I'll tell you more about that later. Another main character you've heard about from Ellie briefly is the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory at the South Pole. Another main character is this NASA satellite in orbit around the Earth. That's called the NASA Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. And the final, the fourth leading character in the story is called the Magic Gamma Ray Telescope. These are both gamma ray telescopes Fermi detects very high energy, excuse me, Fermi detects high energy gamma rays. Magic detects very high energy gamma rays, even higher energy uh, from the Earth. So now you know who's involved in the main story. The next question is, when and where did it occur? So the answer to that is like, when and where many of the best stories occur. And that is a long time ago <laughs> in a galaxy far, far away. So that's, the stage is set now. Now we can dive into the story. Okay, but to characterize, this is still astronomy and physics, so we still need to be quantitative. So what do we mean by long, long ago and far, far away? So let's give a brief review of distances and times in astronomy. So I think you're all familiar, we're all on the same page to start off with. A year is a unit of time, right? We're all familiar with that. But then how do astronomers measure distance? Once you have a unit of time being one year, the way we measure distance is actually also based on that unit of time. So we talk about light years, and that might be confusing because a year is a unit of time. A light year is a unit of distance. So it's a very convenient distance. It's just equal to the distance that a light travels in one year. Light year is a unit of distance equal to the distance that light travels in a time of one year. We're going to talk about neutrinos today also. Neutrinos, because they have very, very small mass, they also travel at the speed of light. So they travel the same distance in the same time as, as light. So that's our basic building block of both time and distance in astronomy. We can also make that much longer or much shorter by just multiplying by large and small numbers. So a year is kind of a medium distance of time. A light year is a pretty long distance of space in, in astronomy. Uh, because we have such large distances, we use this large building block to measure distances. We need even larger distances than 
light years, so we have a billion light years. So that's a, obviously a billion times a single light year. Um, so a billion years is a very long time. A billion light years is a very long distance. So we kind of have these obvious scaling relations, right? We can also go in the other direction. And that's convenient because we can just use different units of time. So a minute is a short time. It should be singular one minute is a short time. And we can also just, again, scale by the speed of light. So a light minute, now depending on your perspective, that's either a long distance or a short distance. By astronomy standards, that's a short distance. By most of our standards, that's a pretty long distance. So a light minute is an eighth of the distance all the way to the sun. So it's still a very long distance. That's the time that it takes light to travel. That's the distance. <laughs> yeah, it's awkward terminology. Light travels one light minute distance in one minute of time. OK, so now we have kind of the time scales and distance scales to go forward. OK, so starting early on, I'll skip over the Big Bang, but we're still going to start pretty far back. Soon after the Big Bang, galaxies started to form. So a lot of you have seen this picture. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. This is a large number of galaxies in a very tiny patch of sky, very, very far away. So this is now 5 to 10 billion light years away. And the universe had already had enough time in the first few billion years of its existence to form these massive galaxies. Not only that, but today we know that most of these galaxies have large black holes at the center of them. So kind of an amazing fact. When I was getting excited about astronomy first 20 years ago in high school, I was reading Stephen Hawking's books, and he was talking about how Black holes were amazing theoretical constructs, but who knew if they were reality or if they would ever be detected. Now we know that basically every galaxy that we've looked at has a giant black hole at the center. That includes our own Milky Way. And most of these are very massive, millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun crammed into a single black hole at the center of every galaxy. So we call that a galactic nucleus, kind of analogous to the nucleus of a cell. It's a massive thing at the center of the cell, and even though it's smaller, it has very important mechanisms to interact with the entire galaxy, even though it's a relatively smaller mass and volume at the center. OK, so another fascinating thing about black holes is that even though they're so massive and so dense that light cannot escape from them, there's this amazing paradox there. Despite that, they're actually the brightest objects in the universe. How is that possible? It's kind of, it's kind of like if you pull the drain on the bathtub and the water spirals down into it, there's matter spiraling down into these black holes, and it's spiraling so strongly that it's glowing up, and it's heating up, and it's being accelerated, and so it's generating huge amounts of matter and radiation that are actually escaping and not falling down into the black hole, but they're actually being accelerated. And that's fundamentally because of the gravitational force pulling all that matter in a spiral down into the gravitational well. And so a fraction of it, after being accelerated, doesn't fall all the way in, but it shoots back out again. And often it shoots out in these jets, so you can see that this is an artist's picture. That jet coming up out of the black hole to the upper right is basically a particle accelerator that's being accelerated by the black hole. So kind of like the particle accelerators that humans build here on Earth, but it's even more energetic, reaching even higher energies of particle acceleration. So black holes are actually some of the brightest objects in the universe. OK, so we've got some of the building blocks of our terminology now. You know what a galaxy is. It's like the Milky Way, but other galaxies much farther away. You know what the nucleus of a galaxy is. That's that black hole at the center of every galaxy, as far as we know. And then there's another third term that's important here, and that's an active nucleus of a galaxy. So some of these black holes are just sitting there at the center of the galaxy. Some of them have a lot of matter falling down into them and spewing out these accelerated beams of matter and radiation. Those are called active, as opposed to quiet or quiescent black holes. So you put that all together, and you get some jargon active galactic nucleus, but it's just got three simple pieces. So here's a side view of that, now a cartoon on the left. Uh, you can see the black hole at the center. You can see the two jets spewing out perpendicular to the matter that's spiraling down into the black hole. If you look from along the side, along the view of one of those jets to the, from the right, you have a top view of the same situation. And at that point, this jet is pointed right at you. And so that subcategory of these active galactic nuclei is what we call a blazar. It's when something's, it's basically like the barrel of a gun just pointed straight at you, having a particle accelerator being pointed straight at you. And so a subcategory of these galaxies with these giant black holes at the center have a particle accelerator pointed straight at Earth. And that's what we call blazars. OK, so now we've got the kind of the basic background of what happened here. And now we, need to, and now we know the time scales and the distance scales involved. So now we can start our story. 
So the story started long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, and now we can say how, exactly how long ago and how far away. And the answer is, it happened four billion years ago, and the information about it just reached us. So we can know right away that that means that the time that it occurred was also four billion, sorry, it happened four billion years ago, so the place that it occurred, the distance it occurred, was four billion light years distant from the Earth. So that's where the story begins. So a particular one of these active galactic nuclei that, that was also a blazar emitted a neutrino. So we'll come to what a neutrino is. But just keep in mind that the distance and the time scale to begin with. OK, I'd like to go through all of the last 4 billion years now, but I know you guys have other things to do. So I'll try to compress it into an hour. So we're going to pay attention to the next minute, because we're going to fast forward a lot very quickly. So what happened over the last 4 billion years? OK, 4 billion years ago, starting point, the neutrino was emitted. It was born at that massive black hole. A little bit later, 3.8 billion years ago, life began on Earth. The Earth had been evolving as part of the solar system until that, cooling down from its original formation. Fast forward more, this is an important part of our story later on. Only a billion years ago, there were two black holes. These are, these are much smaller than the ones at the center of the galaxies, but two black holes basically collided and merged with one another. Okay, continuing with the story here on Earth, half a billion years ago, fish evolved. 0 0.4 billion years ago, land plants evolved for the first time. 0 0.2 billion years ago, dinosaurs and mammals both evolved, roughly around the same time. Dinosaurs and mammals here on Earth. Another important astrophysical event, 0 0.1 billion years ago, two neutron stars merged. So these are like black holes in the sense that they're very massive and very dense, not quite as dense as black holes, so light can escape from them, but they're basically like the giant nucleus of an atom. Similar density, but on the scale of an entire star. OK, now things got a little more interesting for humans. 0 0.002 billion years ago, Homo sapiens evolved. And that included astronomers. Uh, you, get, you, you have to have a lot of digits here. So this is, if you count the zeros, this is 0 0.2 million years ago, or only 200,000 years ago, a tiny fraction of the time that this neutrino had been traveling across the universe. I say astronomers were included in the Homo sapiens because a lot of those Homo sapiens looked up at the sky, and so they were doing astronomy, especially the ones who got more systematic than just looking at it, but they tried to make systematic observations and write down when things appeared and when they changed and so on. OK, another important milestone for the astronomy side is that a star in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a nearby galaxy, exploded at the end of its life. This also happened at the same time that the first humans and the first astronomers appeared. OK, more recently, about 2,000 years ago, particle physicists evolved. And notice that they evolved more recently than the astronomers. You can, you can take from that what you want to. OK, so I'm counting as particle physicists the Greeks, basically. So there was one, especially Democritus, who had a theory of atoms, and he believed that matter was made fundamentally of, of particles. If you don't count Democritus as a particle physicist because he didn't have his own accelerator, you can wait <laughs> until about 40 years ago when modern particle physicists evolved. And so they had giant particle accelerators. And that's when basically our modern understanding of particle physics arrived, and that's called the standard model of particle physics. OK, so what is that standard model of particle physics? Here it is. Uh, I was pretty bad at chemistry. The, the periodic table was way too big for me, and I have a terrible memory. So I really liked physics, which is with its very small version of the periodic table. It's really simple. There are only a few building blocks. And in fact, you can actually ignore most of this. So what is matter made of? It's made of atoms. The atoms are made of nuclei consisting of protons and neutrons. And also, the, the atoms have electrons surrounding them. So we have the quarks that make up the neutrons and protons. Those are the up and the down quarks, and then we have the electron. So if you only care about normal matter, about the pieces of normal matter, you can basically only pay attention to these three. Here we care about more than just the building blocks of normal matter, so it gets a little bit more complicated. In addition to these three pieces that matter is made of, there's also a neutrino, which is associated with those. So it's also a kind of piece of matter, but it's not what matter is made of. It comes out from interactions between matter, <laughs> nuclear interactions between matter. And it's a very important part of how the sun shines. So it is an important part of the behavior of matter, just not what matter is really made of. And then a, a really kind of strange and, and thing that's not totally understood today is that we basically have 
three copies of that same strip of particles, which is repeated three different times. So you have that up, down, electron, and electron neutrino on the left column, and then you repeat that two more times. And that includes this muon and the tau. And so the muon is basically like a very heavy version of the electron. Very similar physics to the electron, but a much heavier version. That muon's also an important part of the story here. Okay, so I've focused on the, the particles that are in black for this talk. We have on the left the parts that make up normal matter. In the middle is the muon and the muon neutrino. These are basically heavier versions of the electron and the electron neutrino. Uh, and so we, they, they organize into these different columns. And because neutrinos have very little mass, they basically travel at the speed of light, very, very slightly below the speed of light. Okay, that brings us to another amazing fact of particle physics, which is that at the very highest energy, very highest energies of light, light is actually absorbed by other light. Something we never experience in everyday life. But imagine you're in a dark room and you turn on a, a beam of a flashlight, you turn on another one and you make their beams cross and one beam is blocked by the other beam. Something you would never have any intuition with in everyday life. But we've measured it in particle physics and we know that that occurs. We've also calculated it and so it all agrees with our understanding of, of modern particle physics. So the very highest energy type of light is absorbed by crossing paths with lower energy types of light. And that's an important problem because for the frontiers of physics and, part and astronomy, we want to understand the highest energies and the longest distances. And we can't do that with light because of this. So if you go to the highest energies and longest distances, light simply cannot travel across the universe. It's blocked by other light, by low energy starlight. So we need something else other than light. And one thing we can use, that f use for that purpose is neutrinos. So they're kind of like super x-rays. X-rays you're familiar with from medical imaging and other applications, they travel th straight through a lot of matter. So they let you image the interior of objects. Similarly, the neutrinos travel straight through the universe, including through matter and light. So they're not blocked by other light or by other matter. Okay, so where are neutrinos produced? They're produced, they're not part of, they're not a building block really of, of normal matter, but they're produced, even though they're made of matter, they're produced by interactions, by uh, nuclear and particle physics interactions around the Earth and around the, the universe. So this is a graph of, you can think of it as how likely a neutrino is to collide with an atom on the vertical axis as a function of how energetic the neutrino is on the horizontal axis. So they were produced abundantly in the Big Bang, all, starting on the way, all the way on the left. They're produced by radioactive reactions, uh, both man-made at reactors, also naturally occurring ambient radioactivity, terrestrial radioactivity. They're produced in the sun as part of the fundamental me mechanism of how the sun shines. They're produced by exploding stars, supernovae. And they're also produced when energetic particles hit the Earth's atmosphere and trigger particle physics interactions naturally high in the Earth's atmosphere. We get a, a bright glow of neutrinos from that. We can also produce them artificially, not only from reactors, but also using particle accelerators on Earth. And what we're interested in in the, in the field of neutrino astronomy is a few of these, especially the, the very highest energies, but starting off at medium energies, the sun and the supernovae that glow in neutrinos. But what I'm going to focus on for Ice Cube is, these very, is the very highest energy range, where there's galactic and extragalactic neutrinos that we think are produced by particle physics interactions throughout the universe. OK, to give you a, a, a benchmark scale for this interaction probability on the vertical axis, Neutrinos at medium energies can travel huge amounts, huge distances through dense matter. So even if you have lead, one of the best materials for absorb, absorbing x-rays and other particles, even, even if you have a light year of lead, a neutrino can travel all the way through it at these intermediate energies. If you go to even higher energies, they'll travel sh shorter distances, but that's the scale at medium energies. Okay, how do we detect the neutrinos? Uh, we use Cherenkov radiation. So a good analogy for what's Cherenkov radiation if you have a, a boat or a duck traveling through the water and you don't see that boat or, or the duck, but you see the wake of it, you can basically triangulate and say there must be a boat or a duck here because there's some waves that are propagating with this triangular pattern from a point that's right here. The same thing happens with charged particles that are traveling through matter. So they make effectively a wake of electricity in their path. And so if you detect and that wake of electricity produces, uh, produces visible light, blue light and ultraviolet light, and so in the case of energetic particles traveling through matter on the right, 
That's actually a picture of a nuclear reactor, which is emitting a lot of these particles, and they're glowing in this blue light, which is the Cherenkov radiation, analogous to the wake of the duck. And so you can figure out there must be an energetic particle or a neutrino that produced that. OK, so this is now the, the foundation of what we call multi-messenger astronomy. So ever since those first homo sapiens, those first astronomers, started looking at, up at the sky, they were doing astronomy with different types of light. They expanded to other types of light, including energetic light like x-rays, low energy light like radio waves, but those are all different types of light. Now with, with particle physics, we can use other types of particles to do astronomy rather than only light. And so we can use cosmic rays. These are energetic nuclei that are accelerated in these, in these large excel naturally occurring accelerators like the black hole that I showed earlier. We can also use neutrinos as messengers to do astronomy. And finally, we can use gravitational waves. That's another exciting new part of this field of multi-messenger astronomy. And one of the, there's a lot of different science we can do with this new, new type of multi-messenger astronomy. One of the most important topics that we can study is the origin of cosmic rays and what their sources are. So we know that there are these very energetic particles we call cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere and hitting the Earth all the time. We don't know exactly what's producing them or how it's pr producing them. But we think that those sources, here's a, the cartoon on the upper left again of this galaxy with the jet of matter and radiation coming out of it. We think that that's producing not only cosmic rays, but also types of light and types of neutrinos. And so by studying those, we can understand the sources and the accelerators out in the universe. And it has, in the case of neutrinos, it has this advantage of being a kind of super X-ray that can go straight through any intervening matter or any intervening light, even though the high energy light would be blocked by what's in between us and the particle accelerator. OK, so that's the idea of multi-messenger astronomy. So how does neutrino astronomy, how does neutrino astronomy work? Here's a, a cartoon of what's going on in the atmosphere when one, of these, uh, when one of these particles, these cosmic rays, hits the Earth. So you can see, for example, a proton uh, coming from outer space as a cosmic ray colliding with the atmosphere. And it undergoes a particle physics interaction to make a bunch of particles. Some of them are absorbed in the Earth, but some of them travel all the way down through the atmosphere, absorbed in the atmosphere. Some of them travel all the way down to the bottom of the atmosphere and reach the ground, and even keep going into the ground. And those are neutrinos and muons. So th those are some of the particles we're most interested in. Now we can detect both of those with a detector like Ice Cube. We can detect both muons and neutrinos. One challenge is that we have a much higher rate of these muons compared to the neutrinos that we're interested in. So we detect about 70 billion muons per year. We have to detect these atmospheric neutrinos, the neutrinos that are produced in the atmosphere, as a very tiny fraction of those, about one in a thousand. And then out of those, we're looking for the astrophysical neutrinos that started above the Earth's atmosphere out in these cosmic sources. So that's only one in 10 to the 8 out of those atmospheric muons. And so we have to find a needle inside a haystack into inside a haystack. So it's a big experimental challenge. And of course, that's on top of the fact that these neutrinos are very unlikely to interact with matter to detect them. OK, coming back to our timeline and our story, uh, so 31 years ago, after kind of this original idea of developing the field of neutrino astronomy, people built detectors that could use Cherenkov light to detect the neutrinos. And they built one in Japan called the Super K detector. And if you remember that uh, star that exploded around the time that humans were first evolving in the Large Magellanic Cloud, the humans had evolved, the particle physici physicists had evolved, they had built this Cherenkov detector, and then that burst of neutrinos from that exploded star arrived at that detector. So that happened 31 years ago. So that was one milestone in neutrino astronomy, that we could detect this first source of of extraterrestrial extra and extragalactic neutrinos. You could argue that this is not neutrino astronomy because those detectors couldn't figure out where the neutrinos were coming from exactly. They knew they were from this supernova because they saw the supernova in bright light at the same time, but they were using timing rather than direction. Okay, continuing forward with neutrino astronomy, there was another milestone where another astronomical object was detected 20 years ago, and this is the image of that. Any guesses of what this? astronomical object is? Sun? The sun, yeah. So I, I mentioned there were two medium energy sources of neutrinos, the supernova and the sun. So this is an image of the sun and neutrinos. The sun is actually much smaller than you can see here. Uh, and that's not because the neutrinos are glowing in a halo much bigger than the sun, but just because of the angular resolution of the detector. So they can't actually image 
with the same resolution as the emission region of the sun. But at least you can say they're coming from that direction on the sky, and that is where the sun is. OK, moving along in the timeline, 27 years ago, it was proposed to do this in ice rather than in, in water. And a detector that was led by the University of Wisconsin, uh, along with a couple other universities, they installed some sensors into Greenland ice, and they detected Trankoff light from muons from the atmosphere. So they proved that you can do this technique in ice, not only in water. That was an important milestone led right here in UW-Madison. 17 years ago, another, mile, another important milestone. They realized that the ice was even better at the South Pole than in Antarctica. It was even clearer, and there was more of it. Uh, and so they installed an array of detectors. You can see it's a bigger group of collaborating institutions and funding agencies at this point. But it was especially enabled by Wharf here at UW-Madison. Uh, so they built a detector called Amanda, and that Amanda detector at the South Pole detected neutrinos for the first time using this Cherenkov detector in the ice. So it's just a flash of blue light due to a neutrino colliding with the ice. Uh, and those neutrinos now were coming from the atmosphere. So they're not just those background muons that were easy to detect. Now we're detecting neutrinos from the atmosphere. But they're still background in the sense that they're not the neutrinos coming from outer space. They're still from the atmosphere. So that was 17 years ago. OK, so that brings us to our second player in the story. We had the supermassive black hole, uh, the blazar, and this is now the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. So this is not to scale, but there's a big detector in the middle of Antarctica. This is now the predecessor of the Amanda, this is the predecessor of the Amanda, sorry, the successor of the Amanda experiment, a bigger version. It's sitting right at the South Pole in the middle of Antarctica, and it's using a large volume of that ice as a detector for this Trankoff light. Why ice? Because you can see straight through it. So it's one of the clearest naturally occurring large volumes of material on Earth so that you can monitor a huge volume of ice for these very rarely interacting neutrinos. OK, so this is the ice, uh, diagram of the ice cube detector. It's basically an array of individual light sensors. There are about 5,000 individual light sensors. And continuing with our timeline, this detector was completed about 10 years ago. A huge effort by a lot of people around the world a really su successful construction project that culminated in, in 2010. So it's a simple, pretty simple concept, but very difficult to engineer and to achieve. Installing 5,000 different light sensors, spanning a cubic kilometer of ice, monitoring a billion tons of ice for these neutrino interactions. Here's how the, the detector was constructed. It's, a, again, a simple concept, but a, an enormous engineering challenge. And this was a success thanks to the Physical Sciences Lab here in Stoughton, just outside of, outside of Madison. So the idea is that you heat up water to very high temperature and very high pressure, and you squirt it on the ice. And then you make a hole, you lower it farther, you keep squirting. And you just do that for a couple days, and you drill down a mile and a half by doing that. And then you just do that 86 different times over, over seven years. <laughs> really, again, really simple concept, a very huge engineering challenge. So there were about 50 uh, drillers on this, on this team working around the clock in harsh conditions at the South Pole to pull this off. Here's a, just a movie of what that process looks like, a cartoon. So squirting that hot water. First you start with just a kind of a hot butter knife approach because there's a layer of snow on top. And if you squirt hot water, that'll just seep out into the edges. Then you pull that hot butter knife approach out again and go with the hot water hose approach. And now this is the fully densified ice it's been compactified after it fell as snow at the top, and it's just solid ice, squirting that hot water and just continue squirting it all the, all the way down a mile and a half deep in the ice. So those holes are a mile and a half deep and about 60 centimeters across. And it's hard to have a feeling for what those numbers are like until you're standing over one of the holes and looking down, and they're just barely wider than my shoulder. So I had the chance to work there for three seasons during construction. A lot of fun, but, but a little bit scary to stare down one of those holes. <laughs> Here's what it looks like from the top. So imagine a mile and a half all the way down to the bottom of the ice there. Here's what it looks like from the, from the surface. Um, there's the new South Pole Station. This is the Amundsen-Scott National Science Foundation South Pole Station. So that's all here. There's, it houses scientists and support staff. There's a runway where airplanes can land and take off. And then across that is where Ice Cube is. So it's deep under the ice here. 
a mile and a half down, but there's a computing building at the top where all of the data come. Okay, so this is a, a large collaboration. This is big science, and it takes a huge team of great people to pull off all of this engineering and science. So as of today, it consists of 12 countries on four continents. It's about 49 different universities and labs around the world, and we have about 300 scientists who are collaborating together. Why is ice, why is ice cube so deep at the South Pole? Uh, it's buried a mile down. First of all, you need a large volume, but even that large volume, we actually displace down in the ice. We don't instrument the top of the ice, and that's for a couple reasons. The ice at the lower depths is actually bubbly. It's more like the ice that you would get in your freezer. It's kind of milky and opaque because it's got little bubbles. But if you go deeper, if you go at least a kilometer down, it's crystal clear, and you can see for hundreds of feet through the ice. And that's what you need to detect this Cherenkov light. We're also using the upper layers of the ice as a shield for these background muons. Remember, we're more interested in the neutrinos than the muons. And so those muons are absorbed by the upper part of the ice. OK, there are two different types of signals that we detect in IceCube. One is what we call a track, and one is what we call a cascade. And you can see they look different. They have different shapes. And so I won't get into the technical aspects of it, but they have different advantages and disadvantages in terms of the science that we can do with them. But they're both signals that are produced by neutrino interactions <coughs> in the ice. OK, so continuing, continuing with our timeline, we completed construction of IceCube 10 years ago. And then, well, we were constructing IceCube 10 years ago. We completed it uh, about seven years ago. And very soon after we completed construction, we made the first discoveries. And so we discovered the first astrophysical neutrinos. Remember these milestones, atmospheric muons, atmospheric neutrinos, now finally astrophysical neutrinos. And so that was on the cover of these two uh, scientific journals that are, that are important in our field. Uh, you can see the pictures of these, of these uh, depositions of energy from these neutrinos interacting in the detector. So remember, this is a huge volume, right? It's a kilometer across. And these neutrinos are so energetic, even though they're a subatomic fundamental particle, much lower mass than an electron, they still have so much energy that they light up this entire uh, kilometer across of light instrumentation. If you want to know what a cubic kilometer across neutrino interaction looks like for human scale, you might recognize this landmark that it's overlaid on. On top of this is the Memorial Terrace. And this is Lake Mendota, and this is a large fraction of the UW-Madison <coughs> campus and Madison. So you can imagine this single subatomic particle lighting up the entire sky over Madison. It's got energy that's, each one of these neutrinos has energy that's about a thousand times more energetic than the largest energies we reach on Earth with human accelerators. Okay, where are they coming from? That's the most important first question. So we discovered that there is this glow of neutrinos from the universe. The next thing we want to do is actually do astronomy with them, answer the question, what's producing them? So we do that the way astronomers answer that question, and you just make a map of where everything's coming from. You image the sky in neutrinos rather than in light. And this is what we get. So this is a simple projection, which is just taking the Earth and projecting it out into the sky. And so the North Pole would be up on the top, the South Pole on the bottom. So the galaxy goes across that view. It's marked in that, as that solid black line, and you can see the galactic plane there. So the first conclusion you can draw really simply from this picture is that they're not coming from the galaxy. They're not all following, following that line. So they must be coming from beyond the galaxy because they're distributed evenly across the entire sky. So that's a really important first conclusion about what's producing them. But for the most part, we have not been able to figure out what's producing them. That's remained a mystery. Beyond this first step of saying that they're evenly distributed across the sky, therefore they're beyond the galaxy. We also did um, another technique. So this first technique was using what we call those cascades, that one spherical deposition of light that I showed you a few pictures of. We also use this other technique, which is when a neutrino converts into a muon inside the detector. And that produces this long, straight line of light. And we can do that. We can image neutrinos coming all the way through the Earth. Remember, they can travel through large distances of matter. The neutrinos travel through the Earth. Then they interact in the ice to produce a muon. And then we can measure that muon in a long, straight track and calculate the direction of the original neutrino. That's a powerful technique because we block out all the muons because the, muon, the original muons from the atmosphere cannot travel all the way through the Earth. Only a neutrino could travel all the way through the Earth. So that in this cartoon, we're looking through the Earth in order to shield ourselves from the muons produced in the atmosphere in order to only detect neutrinos that can travel all the way through the Earth. So we did that approach, and we also discovered 
uh, the signal again, basically, with a complementary method. OK, continuing with our timeline and the story of multi-messenger astrophysics, if you remember this, in, in that first fast forward, there was a billion years ago two black holes that collided and merged. And when they did that, they launched ripples in basically in the fabric of space and time. And those are known as gravitational waves. And so those spent the last billion years propagating across the universe, and they finally reached the Earth three years ago. And at that point, the astronomers and the particle physicists had evolved highly enough that they could build a really good detector, and they were ready, and they detected that ripple of gravitational waves. And so that was a huge discovery three years ago, and it got the Nobel Prize last year. So that's an important part of the story of multi-messenger astronomy. Okay, now coming up to two years, we're getting closer to the present. Two years ago, Ice Cube had basically established this diffuse glow of neutrinos from the cosmos, done a lot of different analyses to try to understand what's producing them, and that's using combining the neutrinos with different types of other signals, including cosmic rays and different types of light. And basically, we, we've been slowly ruling out individual types of sources. And so it's grown as a bigger and bigger mystery of what's actually producing these neutrinos. And so we realized a couple years ago, we can do this better if we partner with our collaborating, tele our collaborating astronomers at other telescopes, not only just looking at data that we've collected, but to do it in real time. So instead of taking years of work to analyze the data to figure out when and where the neutrinos came from, can we do that all within a few seconds rather than in a few years? And so it was a big effort by a lot of people in IceCube to get this infrastructure up and running where now when a neutrino hits the ice, we can calculate the, calculate the direction that it came from within a few seconds and not only calculate it, but release it to the world in real time and tell them when and where to look on the sky in case there's something still interesting happening in that direction. So we implemented that system two years ago. And since then, there have been 14 interesting neutrinos, each one of them within a minute of the time the neutrino collides with the Earth. IceCube automatically calculates where it came from and publishes a website where astronomers can basically say, let's point our telescope in that direction. It's totally open, so any professional or backyard astronomer can point their telescope in that direction. OK, we are still in the meantime trying to figure out what's producing these neutrinos. So a year ago, we published our most stringent search for that. And we basically do that by looking for clustering in individual directions on the sky. And so this color scale indi indicates clustering, if there's any clustering of particular uh, in particular directions on the sky of neutrinos. And that would indicate an individual source of neutrinos. And even though your eye can pick out individual clusters here, none of them are significant statistically. It's kind of like how you can see shapes in clouds, but they're just random shapes. And so as of a year ago, we had still never identified a single source of these very high energy neutrinos. So we're getting closer up to the present now. A year ago, Here's a cool movie showing those 14 different alerts that we've published to the, to the web. So you can see over the last couple years how they've occurred at different positions on the sky at different times. And so you can see we're detecting them from all over the sky and at a roughly random time uh, along the horizontal axis. OK, that brings us to the next milestone. If you remember, in that fast forward timeline uh, over the last 4 billion years, there was also a really exciting ast astronomical event happened, which is that after those two black holes merged, there were two neutron stars that merged. And that light traveled across the universe, and it finally just reached us 12 months ago. So that was another really big milestone in multi-messenger astronomy. You've probably heard about that. That was exciting because not only gravitational waves were detected from that merging of two neutron stars, but also flashes of light from across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So for the first time, we'd seen both gravitational waves and light from the same astrophysical event. So that brings us up to 12 months ago. Now we're coming towards the culmination of this 4 billion year story. After that 4 billion year old neutrino had traveled across those four billion light years of distance. It was really tired after that long travel. <laughs> it was finally ready to lay down to rest. And it collided with a, a molecule of ice inside the South Pole next to the, inside Antarctica in the middle of this, in, in the middle of Antarctica near the South Pole uh, outside the ice cube detector. It produced a very high energy muon. That muon traveled through the detector and it lit up the neutrino. It lit up to the detector. So here you can see all the different light sensors in ice cube that were lit up by that detector. And you can see just by eye that it's, if you draw a line through this energy pattern, the neutrino must have come from over here. The color here represents 
that it's, it came first in this position, the red, and it came last in this position, the blue. And so we can do a more sophisticated than just drawing an eye, a line by eye, a more sophisticated analysis, and we can figure out it came from this particular direction, seven degrees below the horizon, or six degrees below the horizon, uh, within one degree of uncertainty. We also measured its energy. It has a very high energy, again, hundreds of times more energetic than the highest energy particles we've produced at accelerators on Earth. And so, again, this whole infrastructure was set up so that we were, we were ready after this four billion year journey to detect this neutrino. So it collided with the ice, it made the detector light up, the computers on top of the detector calculated what direction it came from, those computers published a website to the public, it did all of that within 43 seconds. And then some other teles some humans read that website and said, that's really exciting, let's point our telescopes over there. Some other telescopes didn't even need a human, they just said, that's really interesting, we're gonna point ourselves over there without a human, <laughs> because there are actually some robotic telescopes today. So you might say that's the next step in the evolution of, of astronomers. <laughs> okay, so here's what came out of that. So 23 different observatories around the world pointed in, in that direction. Ice keeps lucky because it can see most of the whole, it can see the entire sky. A lot of traditional telescopes can only point at a particular direction in the sky. That's why it's really important to release this information within a minute so they can point in that direction while it's still interesting. So a lot of different telescopes around the Earth and also in orbit around the Earth, those ones on top of the Earth are in orbit, a lot of them point in that direction and most of them detected something from that same direction. So there's something interesting going on in the direction of that neutrino. So that brings us, we've gone through the blazar, we've gone through the ice cube detector, those are the first two characters in the story. That brings us to the third character which is the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope operated by NASA. So that's in orbit around the Earth and it's basically scanning the whole sky all the time, and scientists looking at that data pointed out that there was one of these blazars in the same direction as that neutrino. And so that's how we identified that it's likely that it was a blazar, these, this massive black hole that's what's actually produced the neutrino coming from that direction, thanks to this NASA satellite Fermi. That's detecting high energy gamma rays. There's another telescope on the ground, the MAGIC Gamma Ray Space Telescope which motivated by the ice cube neutrino signal and the magic high energy gamma ray and the Fermi gamma ray, high energy gamma ray signal, it searched for even high energy gamma rays, very high energy gamma rays. I know we use technical language for it in this field. Uh, so there are numbers associated with that, but magic detected even higher energy gamma rays uh, coming from the same direction. So this is, so the, the Fermi telescope identified that there was a known blazar in that direction. We already knew there was a blazar in that direction but no one had ever detected a neutrino from it. And so that's the first time that we've identified an individual source of these very high energy neutrinos. Here's just a map of what that looks like, uh, a, a, a map of that region of the sky. You can see the Fermi data is in the, in the color scale here. So purple and orange represents the brightest gamma ray emission from, that, from, from different directions. Uh, you can see these contours indicate where we think the neutrino came from. So with high confidence, it was within this red circle. With medium confidence, it was, it was within this gray circle. Our best estimate of where it occurred was at this green position. And this NASA satellite knew that there was this blazar at this circle position based on this bright distribution of individual gamma ray events from that direction. OK, so you might ask, there are a lot of these black holes on the sky. Isn't it possible that that neutrino just happened to come from the direction of one of those black holes? It's just a chance coincidence. And that's a really important question in astronomy because, unfortunately, to astronomy, the world is basically two-dimensional. So everything's collapsed onto a projection of the sky, right? We don't know, for the most part, how far away something is that we detect. It could be that it came from something that's just roughly the same direction on the sky, but it might be far behind or far in front of the actual source that we're interested in, the black hole that we're interested in. So we basically spent the next several months a lot of astronomers in this field spent the next several months after September of last year calculating what's the probability that this is just a random chance coincidence. And we estimate that it's about one in a thousand. So it's pretty unlikely that this is a false association that we've determined. But it's pretty unlikely, and as scientists, we'd like to be more confident. So we'd like to, be, like to beat that number down and say that it's like one in a million to be, you know, you never, you never prove it, you never have one in infinity, but the higher you can make that number, the lower you can make the probability that you're wrong about understanding what's going on here. So that's what we want to do next, is basically increase our confidence that we understand what's going on. We also know that there, 
are, by doing a quantitative analysis, we know that there are at least 100 different sources producing the diffuse glow of neutrinos that we've detected. So this is just the first one that we've detected. So we want to understand this one better. We want to detect the other 100 or more that are out there. We want to understand what's producing all of the neutrinos. Uh, we think that these black holes are actually only producing a small fraction of the total flux, the total emission of neutrinos. Uh, and so we want to understand what the other mysterious classes of, of sources are that are out there. OK, uh, but there were actually two. The, the story continues because there were actually two different papers that were published on the same day back in July. Some of you might have heard the, seen the newspaper articles and seen the headlines that were sparked by, this, by these two papers. The first one describes the story that I've told so far. And that was kind of old news to a lot of astronomers in the field because of these public web pages. So all these telescopes had been writing public page, pu web pages saying, we identify something interesting from the direction of that neutrino. But there was another exciting part of the story, which is that within IceCube, we had also gone back in our data, not only looking at that 2017 single neutrino that we detected, but saying, if there's a neutrino coming from th this giant black hole in this direction, what about the last decade of data that IceCube's been collecting? Was there, were there ever previous neutrinos from that same direction? And that's a hard question to answer because of this very high rate of background muons and background neutrinos from the atmosphere. But once you have a precise direction to look in, you can do a sophisticated statistical analysis. And we did that, and we found there was an excess of neutrinos from that direction, even before this whole, even before this 2017 arrival of this neutrino. So we detected a burst of neutrinos that happened. It lasted for several months, uh, and it came from the same direction. Here's kind of a picture of what that burst looked like on the sky. It had only th about 13 neutrinos associated with it. But that's enough to be an excess above the background rate of, of other neutrinos from that position on the sky. So it lasted for about five or six months during 2014 and 2015, long before we detected this high energy neutrino in 2017. So that boosted our confidence that we really understand what's going on here, that there's a black hole that's producing all of these neutrinos. Uh, so we, that, but that's just the first step. I should say that we don't really understand because in this case, there were actually no gamma rays detected by the gamma ray detectors from the same direction at the same time. So there's something very subtle and, and exciting going on here that we don't understand yet. OK, so, so to recap, here's kind of the, the timeline of neutrino astronomy, uh, focusing on the story in Antarctica. This, this idea of doing astronomy using neutrinos, using Cherenkov light, using the huge naturally occurring ice at the South Pole, that idea first started in 1988. Then we had this predecessor detector, Amanda. Uh, that reached an important milestone of detecting neutrinos from the atmosphere for the first time, proving the concept of this technique. In 2011, we finished building this large uh, engineering and physics undertaking. An important milestone five years ago, then, the first of these neutrinos from beyond the atmosphere were detected. And finally, just this year, we've announced the first identification of an individual source. So I put a dot, dot, dot here because this is kind of still the beginning of neutrino astronomy. It's the first time we've identified a single source of these very high energy neutrinos. It's kind of like detecting a star for the first time in astronomy. So we think it's the beginning of a new field of neutrino astronomy. So how do we go, go farther from here? We want to keep taking more data with IceCube, of course, understanding the other 100 sources that we think are out there, understanding other types of sources beyond these giant black holes. Uh, but, but it's pretty slow progress with this very small probability of neutrinos hitting an atom. And so we want to build an even bigger detector. That's called the next generation of IceCube, IceCube Gen 2. You can see in the middle here that dense array, that hexagonal array of detectors in the middle viewed from the top is IceCube, and we want to surround it with additional light sensors surrounding it in order to have a bigger volume to collect these neutrinos. OK, before I conclude, I just want to give one advertisement. Ellie mentioned this quickly. If you want to do particle physics, if you want to do astrophysics, you don't need to build IceCube yourself or join us. You can actually use your own detector in your pocket. That's called DECO, the Distributed Electronic Cosmic Ray Observatory. And here are some pictures that we've collected with DECO. The idea is that you run an app on your cell phone. When a particle travels through the camera sensor on your phone, it works very similar to IceCube on a much, much smaller scale. And it can detect individual particles. And so here are some examples. These pictures on the right are individual particles we've detected with DECO. And on the right is a picture of all the different places around uh, kind of the region of Madison and the, the Midwest and the East where users are detecting these particles. You can download it at that website if you're interested. OK, so 
there's a, there's a cliche in multi-messenger astronomy, which is that we're opening new windows on the universe. But cliches, of course, are come to be commonplace because they're true. So I think in this new era of multi-messenger astronomy, we really are opening these new windows. It's new ways of seeing the universe using all of our senses rather than only using sight. We're also starting to use hearing and taste and all these different senses, uh, feel maybe beyond just looking. And of course, in, anal in analogy to our everyday experience, if you can do that in astronomy, then you can learn much more about the universe than just using one of our senses. So here's a cool image of that, kind of taking the analogy literally. Uh, new windows on the universe, these are stained glass windows on the universe. On the left, it's a neutrino detector. In the middle, a gravitational wave detector. And on the right, a gamma ray light detector. So to conclude, neutrino astronomy is providing a new view of the universe. It's kind of this super X-ray vision of the universe. It's giving us totally complementary information, new information beyond what we can do with light. Uh, and, and when we do this new type of astronomy, we found already that the universe is full of these other signals. It's not just full of light, it's also full of gravitational waves and neutrinos and particles. Uh, we've identified the first source, that's an important milestone, but we still have important questions about that source. We want to beat down that probability, that false probability, to much smaller levels so that we can be really confident that we understand this, that this is a, a true detection, even though we think it's unlikely to be an accidental detection. And we want to detect more of these sources and more of the classes of sources. Um, and this new era of observing the universe with all of our senses is just beginning. Thanks. So I think we have a few time for a little bit of time for for questions. Yeah. Could you put up the website again for Gecko? Yeah. You can also just search on the web for Deco Cosmic Ray. In the corner here first. So um, you talked about the same source having super high energy neutrinos, the one that you discovered, but also looking back at the data that was I guess relatively lower energy. The yeah. From the same source, is there a theory about what generates these two different types of neutrinos? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, First, we detected a very high energy neutrino from the source. And then looking back in our older data, we detected a collection of lower energy neutrinos from the same source. So the question was, what's producing those? We don't know. That's a great question. That's one of the things we want to explore. In general, there's fewer high energy particles compared to the more numerous low energy particles. So that's kind of an understandable theme. But exactly the quantitative understanding of that, we, we don't understand yet. And a bigger mystery also is, why were there gamma rays connected to the second case and not to the first? Yeah. How does the uh, ground-based, very high-energy gamma ray detector work? Is it, is it picking up strength off radiation also? Good question. So the question is, how does the ground-based, very high-energy gamma ray detector work? <laughs> That's the second project that Ellie mentioned that I work on. So thanks for that question. Uh, <laughs> I'm helping build one of those, the camera for one of those upcoming detectors. And yes, it's also using strength off radiation. So when a gamma ray collides with the atmosphere, it produces a shower of, of other particles, some of those particles are charged, and so they produce a flash of Cherenkov light, and now it's in the atmosphere rather than in the ice, and then you just run a telescope at night that can detect that Cherenkov light. The challenge is that it's only, it only lasts for a few billionths of a second. So you need very fast electronics to be able to record that signal. I think there was another one. Yeah. Okay, for, so the question was, four billion years is a long time to live, so that neutrino had a, a good life. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think the neutrino had a long and productive and happy life. I'm sad it had to die near our detector. But the question was, how did I get interested in this field? Um, I was really excited about science since I was a little kid, and excited about nature, and science is kind of a way to explore nature, sometimes conceptually, if not you know, in the woods or in the mountains. And then in high school, I had some really good mentors who kind of introduced me to ways of doing the science and then in college and so on. So I had really good mentors who showed me that you can do, make a life doing this, this kind of science. Yeah. I understand I'm related to Amundsen, but I never met him. Okay. <laughs> Just a comment? Just a comment. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thanks for coming. The, the comment was, 
Uh, she's related, she understands she's related to Amundsen, but she never had the chance to meet him. <laughs> Amundsen was one of the, fir the first explorer to reach the South Pole. <laughs> yeah, in the back there. You mentioned that the uh, neutrinos are coming out of the black hole. If the number of neutrinos we detect at certain points is lesser than before, that we indicate that the demise of the black holes is going to occur? Okay. So the question was, if neutrinos are coming from a black hole, if the rate of the neutrinos decreases, does that mean that the black hole is kind of dying, if it's maybe fading away as it's converting into these neutrinos? That would be true, according to our understanding of black holes, that would be true if it was a much smaller black hole. Smaller black holes live shorter because they do emit this, this type of radiation. These huge black holes should live as long as the universe, according to their rate of emitting particles. So they're not at risk of decreasing in volume due to this emission process. They're actually growing because they're sucking in that matter, a small fraction of which is converted into acceleration of particles. Yeah? Um, what are the largest elements in the probability calculation for the one in a thousand? And is there any effect of climate change on detection? OK, two questions. Uh, what is the, what's the rough idea of how we calculate this one in a thousand probability? And the second one, is there any impact of climate change on the detector? OK, the first one, the probability of detection, you basically have to simulate what's going on. So you say, OK, there are a lot of these black holes in the sky. It was important that not only the neutrino came from the black hole, the direction of the black hole, but also it was what we call flaring. It was bright in gamma rays at the time of the detection. And that's kind of a low probability of happening randomly. What's the probability that the neutrino came from this direction and there was a black hole in that direction, and the black hole was brighter than usual in gamma rays at that time. So what we do is we basically simulate the sky, lots of different experiments where we imagine we ran the ice cube detector, we detected dozens of these alert events, which is what we actually did detect, but we randomized their position on the sky with respect to the known configuration of gamma ray data. And we say, in what fraction of randomized configurations of neutrino data relative to gamma ray data did they happen to be aligned in the same direction? And that's the basic way you calculate that probability. For the climate change question, so luckily Ice Cube is really in the middle of Antarctica, so it's very far from the edges where the most severe impacts of climate change are happening. We do see impacts on the logistics of going to and from South Pole. Uh, some of the landing fields have had to be moved just in the last few years because the, basically the landing strips that we use are on ice, she ice sheets in McMurdo Station on the coast, and they're getting unstable. Uh, also, I should mention, we do actually a lot of glaciology and climate science with Ice Cube, because you're probably familiar that ice cores are a really important aspect of glaciology. We have a beautiful instrument which is doing imaging of the ice, and we can actually measure the layers of ice inside the detector, measure layers of dust and volcanic ash, and use, use it as a kind of a time machine of glaciology over the last few hundred thousand years. Yeah. Um, you said early on that it's currently theorized that most galaxies, or all galaxies, have a black hole in the center. Does that even include low ones like the Magellanic Clouds and our fainter satellite galaxies? That's a good question. Okay. Um, so the question is, is it, is it theorized that all galaxies have these massive black holes at the middle, at the center? Um, that's a very active topic of research, both the theory and the measurement. Uh, that, that gets into a little, so the aspect of smaller galaxies and dwarf galaxies, those are less likely to have a nucleus, but that's kind of pushing my knowledge of that field. Um, th but all, all spiral galaxies and large galaxies do as far as we've measured. So basically, wherever we've looked, it's not just a theoretical fact that, or in the simulations of galaxies that we see them, but also it's an observational fact that in basically all the large spiral galaxies we've looked, we have found one of these black holes and including at the center of the Milky Way. Yeah? At one point you implied that there could be other sources for these neutrinos. What else are you considering? OK, yeah, that's a great question. So what made, what made me say that we think there are other sources beside these black holes? That's basically what we spent the last five years doing. Ever since we measured these neutrinos, the question was, what's producing them? And we've done very quantitative analyses comparing our signals to other types of astronomy and when you compare the directions and the energy distributions and the times of our signals with other signals in astronomy, 
you can basically study whether it's associated with other types of astronomical objects. And we've been able to rule out a lot of sources. And in particular, we've actually ruled out that this source of black hole, that this type of class of black holes is the source of the majority of these neutrinos. So at most, 30% of our total neutrino rate could be produced by this type of black hole at the center of distant galaxies. So it's kind of this interesting paradox that we've discovered the first source is this type, and yet we know this type is not producing most of the neutrinos. And if you do a quantitative study comparing the fact that we've not seen any individual sources with the rate of neutrinos we found, we estimate that there are at least 100 total individual sources out there. Yeah. the importance of finding neutrino from the laser. Yeah, so that, that's, thanks. So, so the question was kind of what's the bottom line conclusion of what's the significance of finding neutrinos from this blazer? Um, so if I mentioned early on in the, the motivation for multi-messenger astronomy, one of them is just to see what's out there. You know, new windows, we make new discoveries, unexpected. But one of the most important directed questions that we're trying to answer is the origins of cosmic rays. We know there are these large accelerators that are producing very high energy particles out in the universe. We don't know what the sources are, what these accelerators are, and we don't know how they work. And when there are these high energy particles, these nuclei that become cosmic rays, according to the particle physics, those processes must produce neutrinos. Other processes could produce gamma rays and other types of light, but only the processes that produce cosmic rays could produce neutrinos. So this source of neutrinos that we've identified is also the first, because it has a neutrino emission, it's also the first identified source of very high energy cosmic rays. The other, the other question was, well, Sylvia, how long, because the neutrino is uh, going at very near the speed of light, what, um, uh, how long does, does the neutrino believe it live before it hit the Earth? Okay, because so be because relatively, since it's been a billion years, the neutrino probably didn't, didn't detect the fact that it lived a billion years. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying... He's talking about special relativity. Special relativity. It only emits viewpoint that was only traveling, what, a couple hundred years or something? Okay, so this is a question on special relativity. So <laughs> if you're traveling very close to the speed of light, then time is occurring differently. Um, this is very, very close to the speed of light. So I can't do that calculation <laughs> on the fly, but it would be an interesting question for a graduate student. <laughs> so, so, someone, who, someone who can do that at the blackboard better than I can. Yeah. Uh, if the neutrino is like billions of light years old um, and the universe is expanding and galaxies are moving, wouldn't the source of the neutrino be in a far different spot now? Like if you were looking up at the direction where it came from. If the source is moving. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 So if the source is moving, then you have to deal with the fact that we see it at the position that it was four billion years ago. Um, so it, things are moving on this scale. Most of the motion is due to the expansion of the universe. It's hard, that, and actually on these scales, they're moving relatively quickly just due to the expansion of the universe. It would be unusual for any galaxies to have additional motion beyond that, which would, which would be important. But it's a, it's a good point that you're basically watching a movie of that galaxy four billion years ago as it appeared then, not as it appears now. Yeah. Exactly. So the question was, are you determining the number of neutrinos that are emitted based on our probability of seeing them in the sensors? And that's right. So that graph that I showed you of the probability of hitting a, a molecule increases with energy, we have precise measurements and calculations of that probability. And so based on the number of neutrinos that we actually detect, we can reverse that calculation and figure out how many were emitted that were not detected. And so to quantify the rate of these objects producing neutrinos, that's what we do. Are 
So the question is if, so you can estimate what the rate of neutrinos is relative to what? Oh, the total neutrino rate. Right. Right. Yeah. So the question was, how do we estimate that only 30% at most of the neutrinos are emitted by these black holes? That's actually pretty simple. I showed a map of the whole sky, and we, look f we basically asked the question, for every point in the whole sky in that map, is there a clustering of neutrinos, yes or no? And we say that basically no across the entire sky. There's nothing that's statistically significant. We then repeat a much more narrower version of that question, only looking at the directions where we know these massive black holes are. And again, we don't see any neutrino emission that's significant from that overall collection of directions on the sky. And so we can quantitatively compare that to the total rate of neutrinos that we have measured and show that it's at most 30% of the total neutrinos that we have measured. Yeah? Could you tell us some, excuse me, could you tell us a little bit about that detector? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good advertisement. So Ellie, who was here at the beginning, you can come up and look at the, this detector afterwards. She also has some giveaways in the lobby for kids and adults or right next to her. Uh, so I went through that quickly. It's basically a light sensor. So our detector consists of over 5,000 of these buried in the ice. And you can think of it as like a light bulb in reverse. So a light bulb takes a current of electricity and converts it into light. This takes a signal of light and converts it into electricity. That's what this... Uh, metallic detector on the bottom is. It's a very, very sensitive detector of individual photons of light, of those Tarenkov photons of light. And it's basically got a fancy electronics like a computer above that, which can record that signal very quickly and very sensitively. So it can detect individual photons with a time resolution of a billionth of a second. Because you need that timing and position of all the photons to calculate where the neutrino came from. Do you, yeah. uh, since you get it from both sides of the Earth, it looks like the uh, upper part of the hemisphere is the uh, light. Uh, light will go through there. Will it go through this, the bottom as well? The bottom is actually the sensitive part. The bottom is the sensitive. Yeah, part. this okay. this metallic loaded coated part is the sensitive part, and this is that's the electronics. Tube down there. Right. That's that's called a photomultiplier tube. Okay. So we're actually for this upgrade that we're that we're planning, we're looking at, at more sophisticated sensors that have multiple of these inside of the same sphere, multiple individual detectors of photons pointing in different directions. Kind of like a fly's eye, a small version of a fly's eye with fewer individual eyes. One in the back. OK, since a, a neutrino is not affected by the density of an object at all, is the only thing that's utilizing the energy, that's taking the energy from the neutrino, the particles that it deflect from it then, if I understand that correctly? So the question was, a neutrino is not affected by the density of matter, but is it deflected by the matter? No, I, okay, so it's deflecting particles as it's moving through matter, isn't it? It's basically all or nothing. So for the, at these energies, a neutrino is either traveling all the way through the matter without ever experiencing it, or it slams straight into a molecule, and the neutrino basically disappears and the molecule is shattered into particles. And that's the point when it's traveling through the detector that it's why it's able to uh, produce a current at that point? Yeah, so it's after the neutrino has collided. So how does, it, how does the neutrino produce a current? It collides with the molecule of ice, produces energetic subatomic particles. Those produce the flash of Tarenkov light. That Tarenkov light is detected by the sensors. What level of current is produced by the neutrino? What level of current is yeah. produced by I, the neutrino? I know it's relatively small, but what are we looking at? I, I see one of my grad students, Alex, here. <laughs> Do you want to come do that calculation? Uh, I was working on the first one, so. <laughs> He'd rather do the, the special relativity one. Um, I don't know off, off the top of my head, uh, but to give you a sense of it, when that photon hits that sensor, it basically knocks loose a single electron. So this whole sensor is capable of detecting a single photon that produces a single electron. And then the purpose of the entire sensor and the electronics after that is to amplify that signal into a macroscopic current. So it's measured in, typically in like trillionths of an amp. That gives you kind of a scale for it. Is that one electron volt then, or is that one less than that? Is that one, so the question is, is that one electron volt or much less than that? So 
An electron volt is a, is a measure of energy. So we amplify the energy of that initial electron that's produced by having a series of high voltages, basically. That's what's inside this sensor. And so you're amplifying the energy of that original electron to higher energy, and, and basically by multiplying that electron into a large cluster of a large number of electrons. OK. okay. So if this neutrino can go through anything, why does a molecule of ice kill it? OK, if a neutrino can go through anything, then why does a molecule of ice kill it? OK, so that, that graph that I showed of kind of probability of hitting something versus energy, it's slowly rising with energy. And so at medium energies, on average, a neutrino will go through an entire light year of lead before hitting a molecule. But if you've got an entire light year of lead, it, or if you have a large number of neutrinos, there is that macroscopic probability that one will actually hit, hit a molecule. In this case, we're helped by two things. One is we have higher energy, so the probability is actually much higher in this case. But also we have a huge number of molecules, not just one, but we have the entire basically the entire, yeah, billions of tons of ice around, inside and surrounding ice cube. And so you can multiply basically the probability of hitting any one molecule by the large number of molecules. There's still a, large, a much larger number of neutrinos that travel straight through the detector that we never detect because of that. Mm -hmm. okay. well, yeah. You have to speculate. What else al is, is out there that could accelerate? If you had to speculate, what else is out there that could accelerate things? Yeah, that's the f most, what's my guess? That's the, the most fun question that we've been asking for the last five years. And we basically have a list. It's got like 15 items on it. It's still growing. And we're ticking things off the list one by one. Um, the obvious candidates are these giant black holes. Also, if you're familiar with gamma ray bursts or actually normal galaxies that don't have this active galaxy, those are kind of the three obvious candidates, and we've actually disfavored all three of them. So that's one of the exciting parts of the story, that the obvious things are, seem to be not what's producing them. It could be supernovae. Uh, it could be, if you've heard of a, a really new class of astrophysical transients called fast radio bursts, that's again something Alex is working on. Um, name your favorite astrophysical source, and maybe that could be it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty wide open still at this point. It could be dark matter. We also have a lot of searches for dark matter making neutrinos. Okay, maybe time for one more, otherwise we can stop and I can take some more up here. Yeah. The original layout of ice cube is basically a hexagonal grid. Your diagram, it looked like the plan extension is on the Fibonacci <laughs> flower sequence, is that? That's right. Good eye. So, so he pointed out that the original ice cube layout was on a hexagonal grid, and the new layout is on a Fibonacci sunflower pattern that's radiating out from that. So we actually figured out with experience with IceCube, if you make a regular pattern grid, background muons can actually travel straight through that. It's like driving along the highway and seeing rows of cornfields. And so they can sneak straight through by basically traveling between the detectors. Whereas a grad student in, in Madison actually pointed out a few years ago, if you make this pretty Fibonacci sunflower pattern, then you avoid that, that cornfield effect. OK, one more. So seeing as how this is the last question, I've, and we've been talking a lot tonight about the speed of light, I've always wondered how it is possible, or how have we been able to measure the speed of light relatively accurately, or perhaps accurately down to the very decimal point? How, how do you measure the speed of light? How do you measure the speed of light? That is a good question. Um, my understanding, I haven't followed this recently, but actually, it, it, to some extent it becomes a question of definitions. And I think it might be that the speed of light is actually defined to be a certain thing now. And that's used, then you, then you measure the second, and then use that to measure what the meter is. Someone's nodding his head. OK. So that's the current technical definition. So we actually define the speed of light to be exactly a particular number. Yeah, it sounds like cheating. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone for coming. I can stay around.